And welcome back to MPL Weekly. Marshall Sutcliffe with Seth Manfield and Luis Scott Vargas. And gentlemen, we have a great honor today. Um, this is a, a special uh, time of year when we have a vote for the Magic Hall of Fame. And uh, both of you are in it. And before we make our announcement um, for, for this year, uh, I just wanted to chat really quickly about what it means to you guys. So Luis, start us off. What does the Hall of Fame mean to you? It's a recognition of how much of my life I devoted to magic. Mm -hmm. It's really how I see it. Like yeah. Lifetime Achievement Award. It comes about, you know, you're not eligible until 10 years after you, you, know, you first started playing professionally. And you, it requires some pretty good results to get in. So it really means, you know, it was an affirmation that my peers and people in the community, people at Wizards of the Coast, uh, really thought what I did was Hall of Fame worthy. And that, you know, meant a lot to me. What about for you, Seth? I mean, it's really a celebration for me. It's okay. Like, this has been a lifetime worth of achievement mm -hmm. to reach this threshold that a very, very small portion of Magic players can ever think about uh, joining the Hall of Fame. Very exclusive group of players. And, yeah, just kind of getting to, to celebrate not only just the, the, the inductee themselves, but, hey, this is someone who I've been watching for however many years and to see them finally realize one of their dreams starting to play professional Magic is pretty, in, it should inspire players to, to come and, and play more Magic. No, absolutely, and of course, it's a community thing too, right? It's, it's a community recognizing the people that have dedicated so much time and effort to the game, and also just who are awesome at it, right? Just who, who are great at playing it. And today, we get to unveil the Hall of Fame class for 2019. So, shall we take a look? We shall. Everybody ready? You guys ready? Let's take a look. Right there is your Hall of Fame class for 2019. <laughs> it's Reed Duke. Reed is the only one. Yeah, this is not the first of a succession of uh, player graphics. Reed is, in fact, the only person who got elected to the Hall of Fame this year. That's right. And we can actually take a look at the way that the voting broke down here. Now, to keep in mind, the threshold to make it in is you need to get a 60% vote. And Reed cleared that quite cleanly here with a really high over 94%. It was close. It was close. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, he, was, he was edging on, on, on dipping below the 90th percentile there. But uh, no, Reed, Reed was a slam dunk. Everybody knew it. And that doesn't make it any less special. It's awesome to see how much of the vote he got. Yeah. Reed is one of those very few players that you're just kind of waiting until they're el you're eligible to vote for that player because it does take 10 years since you start playing in your first Mythic Championship. And so Reed was this slam dunk candidate where you're like, all right, as soon as Reed is, I want to vote for Reed, I want to be able to vote for, for Reed as soon as he's eligible. Yeah, being a first ballot Hall of Famer, you know, and with such a decisive part of a vote is, it, it means a lot and it's no surprise that Reed was among them. Yeah, you can see some of his accomplishments listed there. Of, of course, you know, made his big break into the pro scene at the Mox and Magic Online Championship after winning that as Reader Rabbit on there back in 2011. Um, you know, finished among the top five players in end of year rankings for the past five seasons, remarkably consistent. He's played every Pro Tour and Mythic Championship since his debut. And I can tell you, you know, if you dig a little bit deeper, there's some insane runs in there. You know, when he first broke onto the Pro Tour, he wasn't qualified for every event. He had to string together like six PTQ wins in a row, keep qualifying, qualifying, qualifying. And then he finally got a good handhold. And of course, you know, the read that we know now, he never looked back after that. But I mean, this was somebody who had to earn their way on kind of the, the good old fashioned way the whole time. Yeah. What about for you, Luis? What stands out about Reed Duke for you, you know, as now a Hall of Fame elect? You, you know, kind of what it takes to be in the Hall of Fame is a combination of a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, one of the most important really is just raw skill. Like, how good are you at playing the game of Magic? Do I think you're a world-class Magic player? Not even world-class, like one of the top, top, one of the best. And I think Reed is. I have played against him many times. In fact, <laughs> played in the last two Mythic Championships. Oh, really? He, he beat me both times. Uh, in some insane matches, and it just further cemented uh, to me that he is just one of the best players to have ever played. And I, wow. you know, and that that matters a lot. If you, I mean, if you look at the people I vote for for Hall of Fame, I put a very high premium on skill. Reed easily clears that bar, and that really stands out to me. So you're happy to see him in? Yeah, you can. Say that. <laughs> okay. What about you, Seth? What stands out for Reed for you? I mean, there's a number of, of things about Reed, as LSV just said. I mean, his accomplishments, his stats speak for themselves. When we look at as a Hall of Fame voter, someone who had a ballot this year, looking at something like a mean or a median finish, it's like, are those real numbers or are those yeah. just like? <laughs> but yeah, no, he's 
he's done it. He's done everything, and then from a perspective as a teammate, I've got to see him outside just playing the games. He is a professional magic player in kind of every sense of what it means to be a professional magic player. He comes prepared. He is the one who has a collection where he's like, you know what, I have enough cards, I'll let you borrow something for an event. Sure. He'll come with you know, his pen and paper, his dice. <laughs> These are little things that maybe we don't always bring well, to a team Luckily, it's not a prerequisite <laughs> to bring uh, dice <laughs> to be in the Hall of Fame. you, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yes. But you're right, he's a pro's pro. Right, I mean, he he brings the professionalism to the table each and every event. You know, what stands out for me was going back to the first World Championship. We called it the Players Championship that round uh, that that year back in 2012, and Reed did not do well. Uh, you know, he was a little deer in headlights. He didn't run very well, and he kind of got ran over in that field. I think he finished with two wins. He went two and ten. Yeah, so really tough for him. But what he did was he got his notebook, which he takes notes when he's playing to help himself learn. And he just listed out all of his mistakes, all the things he would have changed, all of the things he needs to work on, and got right back into it. And I thought, wow, that is so hard, because you know it's so easy to make excuse. oh, I got unlucky, or maybe just feel bad, right, for a while, because it didn't go the way that you hoped. And if you fast forward one year later, he found himself in the finals of Worlds. I mean, qualifying for Worlds is, is a feat in and of itself. He made it all the way back to the finals, and he was this close to winning it as well. I mean, we were talking about you know going from last place at Worlds to the next year, getting second, and being this close to actually winning. I was super impressed uh, you know, by his work ethic there. Yeah, and I, I had the privilege of battling him out for player of the year um, last last season. Now, neither of us won it, but um, yeah, he's been right there at the top of the game. He's, he's yeah, I mean, he's definitely in that conversation for the best player in the world. Yeah, so awesome stuff. Congratulations to Reed as the uh, Hall of Fame elect for 2019. And we actually had a chance to hear from him shortly after he was informed of being elected. Let's listen to that right now. I got a text message from Scott and he said, Hey, this is Scott Larrabee from Wizards of the Coast. Would you mind if I give you a call in a minute? And I, I was like, Oh my God, it's, it's happening. And you still don't even really believe it at this point. You know, there's, he's like, you think you're going to pick up the phone and he's going to be like, Oh, you forgot to sign your waiver at the last tournament or something. And it's going to be a complete, um, you know, wild goose chase. But but I was like, yeah, maybe this is actually the day where, where I'm going to get the call. And so I said, absolutely, you know, I'll make sure I'm at a good place with, with good uh, cell reception. And five minutes later, he called me and we talked. And, he, yeah, he told me I was, I was the, in, in the next class for the Hall of Fame. One thing that's cool about this whole experience is I remember my very good friend, William Jensen, getting in the Hall of Fame. And it just so happened that he was visiting me. Um, hanging out in my hometown of Sugarloaf, New York, when he got his call from Scott Larrabee. And I remember, you know, his phone rang and he's like, hey, I got to go take this. And he walked outside and he talked for a minute. He came back. He was all teared up and it was like a very memorable experience. And so when when my phone rang and I was basically in the same place, having the same experience that I'd watched my friend have and, and had brought him so much happiness um, that was really cool. And also, you know, just, it's like, you know, finally being part of the club, which is a weird way to say it, but, but all these, these, um, guys that I, that I looked up to for so many years and watched play and, and they're my heroes. And now, you know, my picture is going to be up with them on the website in concept, the hall of fame has always been a goal for me. Um, even when I didn't know it. Because it's it's been many years and a, a big portion of my career with Magic where I said, I love this game more than anything. I want to be the best or I want to be one of the best or I want to be the best player I can be. And it was probably a few years after that, after I'd already been thinking in those terms, when I realized that the Hall of Fame existed. And I, I sort of thought to myself, this is a perfect example of what of a goal I want to set for myself, you know, that this is this is in place in order to uh, recognize long-term achievement and consistency and somebody who could really dedicate themselves to the game. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I never really envisioned myself in the Hall of Fame, but I always knew it was something that I wanted to work towards. I would still really, really like to be the world champion. That's something that I've dreamed of all my life. And it's taken on extra emotional weight for me after um, I, I was the runner up in 2013. Um, 
And, you know, the, the world championships is extremely difficult to not only compete in and do well, but even to qualify for. So every year that passes, I just sort of treat it as though it's going to be my last opportunity. And uh, that includes this year. So I'm really going to put everything I have um, in the next handful of months towards qualifying for the world championships. And I'm going to treat it like my, my last shot to be the world champion, whether that winds up, whether, whether it winds up being my last shot or not, I'm going to treat it that way. This is um, the culmination of, of basically a lifetime of uh, hard work and support. I would like to thank, my brother Ian and my cousin Logan, who have really been with me since day one. I do believe that the the early part of a career in magic tends to be the more difficult part where you're, you're trying to answer those questions of, do I belong here? Can I do it? Can I make it? And those guys always believed in me and they always helped me no matter what. So thanks to them, wouldn't be who I am without them. This is just a once in a lifetime thing. And when it actually happens, you have this whole span of time you know, 10 years on the pro tour, 25 years with, with the game flash before your eyes. And it, there's just no words really for, uh, the culmination of, of, uh, you know, a a life lifetime or a decade of hard work. Boy, he wasn't kidding either. Uh, Reed's been playing since he was five, you (laughs) you know, when he says 25 years, you're like, well, how can he, it's no, (laughs) he's actually been playing for 25 years. Awesome stuff from him and huge congratulations to Reed Duke your Hall of Fame elect for 2019. Now, we're gonna focus back in here on MPL Weekly because we've got more matches to cover. We have not uh, given away that coveted day two seat yet. Take a look at the bracket to see how things have gone so far. In our opening round, we saw Ben Stark win what ended up being quite a close one against Andrea Mangucci to put himself into the grand finals and knock Mangucci down to the lower finals. It was Reed Duke, who we just saw, uh, defeat Ray Sato two games to zero to advance to the lower finals, which is where where we're going to end up now. So this is gonna be Mangucci versus Duke, as you can see going back in time here. Uh, Reed starting in 1995 <laughs> as, a, as a small child, but uh, it's worked out pretty well for him. Uh, in fact, for both of these players, I have to say. And uh, you know, both of these guys uh, at the top of the game uh, currently, you know, they're both uh, you know pros that you see at every event during the MPL and all that kind of stuff too. Um, and we get a chance to watch them battle against each other. Now, uh, matchups wise, Reed is on Vampires. And what about Meguchi? He's on uh, Esper. Yeah. So and where do we? Where does that sit for you? Lisa? Normally, it's a, it's pretty close to a toss up. Just these these uh, vampires are just a great deck. But Esper's pretty good at fighting creature decks. Okay. Without uh, Kaya's Wraths, I, I, I have to say that's improved Reed's chances quite a bit. Okay. Yeah, I think Reed has. If I was to choose a deck that I would want seeing the four different decks, I would choose Reed's. I mean, I think that okay. he's got a slight edge, but that anything can still happen. Yeah, and, and just to to point out how big of a deal not having the Kai's Wrath is, it's not only the effect that it just kills all of uh, Reed's creatures, he also doesn't have to play around it. He can just dump his whole hand, which frequently some of the value you get from having sweepers is your opponent will just choose not to deploy their third or fourth creature right. in anticipation of you maybe having it. Right. Now you just know for a certainty. Okay, well, guess what? It's time. I'm going to hand it over to our lead play-by-play here, Luis God Vargas, <laughs> to take it away for our lower finals. Already here, we've got uh, Reed's opening hand here, playing Vampires, uh, facing off against Andrea, playing Esper, and is this the sort of opening hand you like to see when you're playing Vampires? This is the exact hand, minus a one drop, but this is, I mean, this is, you can't complain. This is a great hand. Um, you have the the Wombo combo, if you want, if you will. Uh, the Soren into the Champion of Dusk, that's kind of the, the combination Reed was hoping for in the previous round. Now he is on the draw, so that does matter somewhat, but it looks like Andrea has a very reactive set of cards here. Yeah, and uh, e- even though you know Andrea has a couple, a pair of Legion's Ends here, the, just as you mentioned, the 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 threat of going Soren into Champion of Dusk is still pretty good, even without any other vampires in play. Yeah, but notably, sometimes this happens when you have a lot of expensive cards and you also need three colors of mana, um, the mana base, right? So the mana is looks to be also. To, going to be compounding issues here for Andrea. Yeah, no, I, Andrea is short not only colors but quantities of mana and that's going to put him in a pretty tough spot, especially since Reed is in fact going Sorn into Champion of Dusk here. 4-4 four, four that uh, lets him draw an extra card, but critically leaves uh, both a 4-4 four, four and a Sorn in play as threats. Yeah, and if Reed had 
didn't have that other champion, he might have considered making a different play there and tried to get more value out of that first champion. But since he has another copy, he's like, you know what, I, I'm fine with a 4-4 that draws a card, and then later on, if I need it, maybe I'll have more vampires on the table. But it looks like we might just not even get to that later stage of the game. No, Reed is really going for the throat here, and uh, that champion of dusk plus the Sanctum Seeker puts Andrea in on a really fast clock, and Andrea's just unable to play cards. So. It uh, looks like a, a third lane of Drowned Catacomb here for Andrea. So now he has unlocked the ability to play Mortify, which looks like he's going to wait on to see where Soren distributes a counter. Yep, and that Mortify, it's it's going to stem the bleeding. It might mean Andrea survives a couple more turns, but it's hard to picture a way, a route to victory, especially as you mentioned it. There's no way to really clear off multiple creatures with one spell. Right, this is the kind of game where if Andrea was able to Mortify champion, then untap and play Kaiserath. You think you'd have a shot there? Yeah, oh, for sure. I mean, if you trade a Basilica Belhaunt, and now Andrea mentioned it in one of his interviews, his list, he changed it a little bit um, from the previous version of the deck, and he's he now has the maximum number of cards like Basilica Belhaunt getting ready for Benes. Unfortunately, that has kind of spiraled on him because not only did he lose the first <laughs> round, against Ben, but now he's also, he's just not playing against Mono Red, so um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, these Bell Haunts have, haven't really uh, performed up to snuff uh, in this particular top four just because none of the decks that they're good against ended up showing up. And when you have multiple Sanctum Seekers, if you're able to, able to attack with a Vampire and get multiple triggers, it's, it's pretty great. All right, so fourth land for Andrea means that he's, he's gonna be able to play that Vraska's Contempt can't just kill Soren or, or he's dead on board, so he's gonna look at killing one of the other two vampires in play and still most likely looks like dying to a, a combination of Soren and potentially other Soren. Yep, so it looks like the Sanctum Seeker is gonna come down, um, but yeah, that's the, and that's gonna be it. Yeah, regardless of which uh, vampire Andrea killed with uh, Vraska's Contempt, he was too far behind, gonna take too much damage. Yep. So how does sideboarding change things here for uh, Andrea? So for Andrea, he's looking for more removal. He's got that card, Cry of the Carnar Carnarium. Unfortunately, it's just that one copy, but I think that is the best card that he's got in the matchup. He'll be looking to, to draw that. Um, and it looks like he's going for Enter the God Eternals, Noxious Grass, so more removal to try to stop Reed from being able to get a bunch of creatures in play, which is exactly what he was able to accomplish in the first game. So Andrea just loads up with a bunch of removal, one mini sweeper and Cry of the Carnarium and a bunch of uh, point removal. On the other hand, uh, Reed, well, we already see four copies of Duress heading in there and uh, two Noxious Grasps alongside three Gideons. What do you think of those swaps? Yeah, I mean, this is heavy sideboarding. Gideon is a really tough card to get off the battlefield. Um, Andrea does have a few answers to it. Noxious Grasp, Rasmus Contempt, possibly a Teferi Hero of Dominaria tucking it, but it's it's still a really strong card. Um, and then Duress is really what you're looking for to be able to kind of realize, okay, I can kind of commit multiple vampires after a Duress. It allows you to play with perfect information, which is what Reed wants to be doing. I like the the split of 3-2 split of Adanto Vanguard Legion Lieutenant because of uh, Legion's End. Though it looks like at the end of the at the, oh, at the last minute read switch back to 4-1. And I like taking out the Sanctum Seekers because they're just the clunkiest vampire and if you already have multiple vampires in play, you're probably ahead at that point anyway. You don't necessarily need the life draining. All right, Manguchi on the play again, and well, Reed, you know, a hand of three sideboard cards, which if you've sideboarded well, that usually is something you're looking forward to. Yeah, this is an interesting hand. I, I know Reed would be dying to, to swap one of those planes out for a swamp, but um, he did draw a card he can actually cast on this first turn. Yeah, turn one leads in landing here, and on turn two he's gonna have the option of casting Duress or Vicious Conquistador. Uh, what, what, what is your prediction there with a turn three Gideon on deck? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know what he's gonna go with, I mean, I I think it would be the Vicious Conquistador. There is only one copy of Cry of the Carnarium in Menguchi's list, so I think I lean that way, but the fact that you have two duresses means maybe you want to fire off a duress. All right, Reed is going to fire off a duress. See three removal spells, <laughs> none of which actually kill uh, Gideon right now. He, he could take any one of those. 
Yeah, and the Cry of the Carnarium, it is a one of, and you can simply get rid of it with the Duress. Duress trades for it one for one, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. So I think that's what we're going to see here being selected. Reed does, in fact, take Cry of the Carnarium, leaving Andrea with two spot removal spells, and ooh, now an Oath of Kaya. Yeah, an Oath of Kaya by itself also does not get rid of Gideon, so it looks like that's just going to come down, trade down on mana, but up on life, and just go ahead and get rid of that token. It comes in a Danto Vanguard, but uh, Reed knows the way is, is clear because he knows that Oath of Kaya uh, it was the draw, so he's going to slam a Gideon here. Put a big threat into play that's largely immune to Andrea's removal, and then next turn he's got the option to duress. Oh man, things are working out perfectly for Reed. Look, just, uh, he just drew a Soren. Yep, everything's going Reed's way, and Andrea needs to top deck. He cannot win with just the cards he's got in hand, and the duress is gonna. It's gonna clear the way. He can select either this end of the God Eternals, the Legion's end, depending on which direction he wants to go, and then. Andre also needs to answer the Gideon, but even if he draws an answer to the Gideon, it's not clear that that alone would be enough to win the game. All right, we, Reed gets to see Enter the God Eternal's Gut drawn, and that's a hugely powerful card. Even if it doesn't directly interact with Gideon, it still seems hard to resist taking that one. Yep, and it, it is what he's going to go for, especially this game he does have a good ratio of lands to spells. He may not have the right, the exact right spells, but he's got... You know, the five lands, the combination of spells, which is, from an Esper control perspective, you can't really ask for much more than that. Yeah, one disadvantage to how Andrea sideboarded, he took out all the Narsets, which, I, you know, seems right in the matchup, but it leaves him a little light on card drawn. Here you see five land plus four removal spells, and Reed's just dismantling him with duresses and planeswalkers. Yep, and so Reed may may not be in a rush. He may he may think, well, why do I need to play this Advanto Vanguard right now? It simply trades with one of the cards in Manguchi's hand. So he might opt to to go with a different line. And it looks like that is what we're gonna see. And Reed, Reed Reed's never in a rush in my experience. <laughs> so he, he's he's gonna he's gonna play it safe here. Andrea draws another hallowed fountain. Does he has two removal spells in hand, which is what you want to draw against a creature deck, right? No targets. Just he can bounce a Gideon, I suppose, if he really wants to. Yeah, I, I was the Tyrant Squirt. It looks like a bounce spell at this point, which is not really what, why you play it in your deck. But um, you, you have to deal with the, the Gideon in some respect, or else you're just gonna fold to it. Reed has some options here, and it's really this Gideon. It, it might just go all the way to the house, right? Like, I mean, it's just like Gideon, the, the other cards, they all trade off with each other, and then sometimes you just have this threat in the Gideon Blackblade where it's, if Andrea doesn't draw exactly the right set of answers to it, there's really, there is no answer to it. And here here you see Andrea, or uh, Reed choosing not to play Vicious Conquistador or Adanto Vanguard in the face of that Tyrant score in Allegiant's End. What do you think about that, just not playing any creatures? Well, he might be trying to get Manguchi to actually use the Tyrant Scorn that he knows about and saying, you know what, Manguchi, I don't have any creatures in hand, so just use this Tyrant Scorn when, in fact, he wanted to get Manguchi to make the first move. Oh, huge draw for Andrea there. Uh, thought, uh, thought Erasure is going to go ahead and take out that Gideon and actually leave Reed a little bit light on threats, and, in fact, drawing that second Adanto Vanguard is a little bit of a liability in the face of uh, Legion's End there. That was perhaps the most awkward draw on the deck. Um... He knows about the Legion's and its face up. He could choose to sacrifice an Adanto Vanguard. He could choose to not play an Adanto Vanguard. Simply playing Vicious Conquistador and Adanto Vanguard and then upticking a Soren to put a counter on something. Almost certainly that Legion's end is going to get cast on the following turn. So it's kind of hard to navigate. I mean, that's what you're kind of hoping just not to draw a card that you have a second copy of knowing about that Legion's end. Well, it looks like Reed's just going to play the Vicious Conquistador, buff it with Soren, hope Andrea misses and is forced to use Legion's End. Oh, Andrea do Teferi. Andrea's turning this game around. He is, and he's going to get to play this Teferi. Now, I do think it's a little bit interesting. If he just goes ahead and draws a card, Reed can still get rid of it, right? Unless he draws a land. If he draws yeah. a land, he might want to go ahead and use the Legion's End. Looks like Andrea is just going to tuck Vicious Conquistador, essentially trading... Uh, Teferi for 
the Conquistador and potentially eating a Soren minus or Soren plus to deal three. And Reed is not mad about this because now he has a great use for that second copy of Adanto Vanguard, simply sacrificing it um, to get rid of the Teferi. And he's still ahead in the spot, but <laughs> I mean, we know Manguchi has cards like Liliana, uh, Dreadhorde General. So he's got cards that he can draw and just completely change the game around. Yeah, so Reed gets to play a Legion, second Legion's Landing. And uh, conveniently enough for Reed, he, he, he got all the cards out of his hand right as Andrea draws another Thought Erasure. And now we've got a 1 1, but plus a Soren facing down Andrea's nothing. And Soren is a pretty fast clock here. Yeah, and it looks like that Thought Erasure just may end up being two mana scra uh, Surveil 1, which is not optimal, but at this stage in the game, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, what Andrea has to think is, what, what is Reed gonna draw that he wouldn't play out? And the answer is not really anything. Maybe like something like a Noxious Grasp, or a yeah, Duress. Second Soren. But even Duress, you would just cast and take the Thought Erasure. Yep. Right. But he did top the card, so we, we know it's a spell. We, d we don't know how good it is, but we know it's something worth keeping. Second Legion's Landing from Reed. If he can get up to three and flip uh, a Danto, that's a pretty big swing, but Andre's gonna try to fight that. He kept the Oath of Kai on top. He's gonna take out the 2-2 token. Still, Reed is getting an advantage every single turn with his Planeswalker here. Yep, I mean, it doesn't really matter that Reed's cards are so cheap. He's still trading a three-mana card for a one-mana card, so he's, it's still gonna be about who draws more spells. Well, uh, Devout Decree taking out Soren here, get it, letting Andrea scry, and now we've got a much closer game. Andrea gets to put the card on the bottom, Reed draws a land, so now we're, we're truly in a top deck war with Reed having a decent amount of pressure on the board, but far from enough to, to, to lock it up. We've seen how important the sideboard cards can be. Uh, the Gideon was really good for Reed, and now the Devout Decree, but, okay, the Temple is nice, but I believe he put that card on the bottom, so. He did. Reed is still ahead, and he can freely play out this Legion's Landing, right? right. He's not worried about any sweepers besides... Reed has lethal now. Reed has uh, uh, five points of damage. Andrea's at five. Andrea needs to top deck something here to get out of it. And what does he draw? Well, Teferi Time Reveler will give him another turn. Yeah, he can bounce that Oath of Kaya if he wants to. Um, so that is what's going to happen. And that's going to put him up to eight, which is a much better spot than he was... He's certainly a much better spot than the previous turn. So now, Andre's gonna take out, looks like he takes out the Vicious Conquistador instead of the 2-2 token, perhaps hoping to draw another Legion's End. Yeah, and I don't think Reed, I think he correctly, he is not gonna attack that Teferi because the Oath of Kai would trigger, and Teferi, it's not really relevant again until a couple more turns, and Reed is hoping that the game ends before then. Oh, Frosca's Contempt, a, a big draw for Andrea. Andrea's now basically stabilized because he can Frosca's Contempt the 2-2 and it'll leave a 1-1 against the Teferi with an Oath of Kaya in play. I think that this game is now slightly in favor of Menguchi. Just because the Esper control should have, you build your deck, it's a control deck, it should have slightly better top decks. All right. See what Andrea draws here. Liliana Dreadhorde General, is that what you're talking about? <laughs> uh, that might, that's a pretty good draw, I think. Uh, I'm sure he'll accept that one off the top of his deck, and this game went from close to, well, not that close. And, you know, here we see an Adanto Vanguard for Reed, but really going to be hard to fight against the power of Liliana Dreadhorde General. You know what, it, funnily enough, may have cost Reed a little bit this game, drawing two Adanto Vanguards instead of one Adanto Vanguard and one Legion Lieutenant. <laughs> Despite the fact that Vanguard is generally a much better card in the matchup. Yeah, Vanguard is traditionally very good against control decks, but it, Andrea has correctly kept in these cards that exile it or that bounce it so that he's able to have answers for, for that card. And, you know, we're, we, we've watched a lot of uh, read games here. We're not going to see a concession despite the, no matter how hopeless it gets until Andrea actually kills him. But given the way things are going, that might not be too far away. One thing Reed is known for is don't throw in the towel until the game is over. So um, he has, he's under no pressure to do that. Now, the fact that Andrea has been able to get this value from the Oath of Kaya bounce means that a line of, say, Soren, Soren to deal six damage, you don't have that option. No, and uh, Liliana Dreadhorde General is, continues to tick up. Andrea's even in a position where he doesn't have to, and I guess Reed sees uh, an ultimate coming and sees the writing on the wall here. Oh, wow, he was about to concede, and yeah. then he's like, you know what? I'm, I'm not gonna concede just yet. 
You might as well get a little information about Andre, uh, Andrea sideboards here with that duress. And he now knows that Andrea, if, if Reed didn't think he was bringing in those devout decrees, he now knows they're, they're all coming in. So a little bit of additional information that could end up being relevant. And... <laughs> I like this. Reed, Reed's <laughs> toying with our emotions here. <laughs> this, these are the mind games for all of us watching this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, an unnecessary mortify here to really just lock things up for Andrea. But you know what? Reed's going to be on the play for game three, and he's hasn't been doing too well in the die rolls, I think, so he's going to be happy to have that going for him. Yeah, and then, you know, one of the one of the small things that happened this game was Reed drew Isolated Chapel two planes with three single black cards, so that, that would definitely lead to a bottleneck, and uh, I guess Reed's hoping that he draws the right mix of, you know, swamps to black cards, planes to white cards, which Vampire sometimes has a, has a little bit of a problem with. You would think playing a two-color deck that your mana would just be squeaky clean and you wouldn't have to worry. Uh, that's very far from the case, especially having all of these cards that you need to play on turn one and turn two. So you really need both colors early on. And I mean, you look at Reed's mana base. He does not have any copies of uh, Temple of Silence. Like that shows the need for untapped uh, mana on turn one. But of course, it means you have to play seven planes, seven swamps. Sometimes you're just going to draw three of one and one of the other. Yeah, we've seen some versions with the Temple of Silence, maybe one or two copies, um, but there is a trade-off there, right? Having a tap land is very, very different when you're hoping to curve out. Um, but Reed, Reed has 20 one-drops after board. <laughs> That's a lot of one-drops. And I don't blame him. I mean, he's he's got more a higher density of spells, and his spells are primarily just trading one for one with Andreas until turn six, turn seven, when he's able to to stabilize the board like he did, but he was fairly fortunate to be able to to do that um, with a combination of of things going his way after what seemed like the early turns generally should favor Reed, and then Andrea is going to hope that his deck cooperates to bail him out. Reed finishing sideboarding Andrea, still looking to see if he wants to make any last minute tweaks here. You know, he's on the draw. He only has uh, two of the thought erasers in the sideboard. And, uh, you know, they, they came, the first one came at a critical time to take that Gideon. Thought erasure, it's really awkward, especially on the draw. Um, especially if Reed, if Reed goes one drop into another creature, do you want to get rid of Reed's creature or do you want to cast a thought erasure? Because if you don't cast it on turn two, then it just might not do anything. If you wait even till turn three or turn four, Reed might already have played all of his spells. All right, read on the play here with double one drop, Legion Lieutenant into Champion of Dusk. Looks like a pretty ideal hand. Would love to see a Soren for a turn three champion there. Oh yeah, this is this is what he's looking for. And this is him hoping that Andrea does not draw lead. Yep, there it is. <laughs> there it was, yeah. Legion's end. Legion's end. Now, he doesn't know that Reed has a second copy of Vicious Conquistador in hand. So oh, there's the Soren. Wow. So, so being on the play critical here because now Reed is going to play this Legion Lieutenant, hit for three with Vicious Conquistador, and he's going to put Andrea to the question of what does he want to do on turn two? That was, that was it. I mean, you called it. The card he was looking for just materialized on top of the deck and Soren. Andrea, well, this is where he wants a Thought Erasure to, to know what's going on a little bit, but he, he's just going to have to play in the dark and, and hope that the decision he makes is going to be the correct one. Oh, and he Legion's End's the right card, by the way. He, that, that is surprising, but well done. Well, I, I think Andre's pretty good. <laughs> oh, he's a very good player. I mean, I, I think the, that the, the fact that he's got a Noxious Grasp in hand might have tipped him into doing that. Um, and he might also think that Reed has sideboarded out some copies of Legion's Lieutenant. If that was what was going through his mind, that, you know, props to him, because generally speaking, you get rid of the Legion's Lieutenant is going to be a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a little bit more powerful. No, that was a, that was a really good call by Andrea. Still, Reed gets to play Sorn, minus it, put a champion of dusk into play, draw two cards, the biggest mold drifter I've ever seen, and this leaves Andrea still pretty far behind. One of the you know really th powerful things about the Sorn opening is it leaves a Sorn and a creature in play. So even if Andrea could kill the champion, which I don't actually think he can on this board, he's still going to be facing down a planeswalker. Now Reed's just going to really be able to, to, to kind of explode with mana efficiency here. What, what do you think Reed's looking to do this turn, just dump his whole hand? I, I think there's nothing that's going to stop him from playing out all of these cards. Um, unless he's really, really 
focused on the Cry of the Carnarium, but the fact is Andrea's only got one copy of, of that card, and if he uses a removal spell on the Legion's Lieutenant during attacks, that would make it even more clear that you can dump your whole hand out. Reed also has the option to hedge a little bit, right, if he wants to use Soren to put a plus plus one counter on the Vicious Conquistador. Yes, that is another option. He probably is thinking about that. Do I want to use Soren before attacks to maybe get in one more point of damage or attack first and make Manguchi play a spell, a, remo a, remo a removal spell in this case? Now, can we see a bounce off the Tyrant Score? No. He's so going to use Tyrant Score to destroy the Legion's Lieutenant, saving the Noxious Grasp. What do you think he's saving Noxious Grasp for? Gideon, I guess? Yeah. You know. That's the only logical answer there. All right, here comes a, a, just a whole slew of vampires. The plus plus encounter on the Vicious Conquistador. Andrea just dying for Akaya's wrath here, <laughs> looking at this Basilica Bell haunt and <laughs> wondering, you know, yeah. did he get a little too clever for his own good? We'll see. I mean, Andrea still is very much in this game, but he's under so much pressure here. And one of the weaknesses of Esper, look, Andrea has four cards in hand, can only play one of them this turn, no matter, he gets to pick one. He does not get to play multiple cards in the same turn. Yeah, I mean, he might dump, dump out the Basilica Bell Hunt or the Oath of Kaya thinking, all right, well, I can. Pl I don't want to play the Noxious Grasp this turn because I want to be able to play two spells next turn, but he might just be too far behind at that point. All right, Oath of Kaya, or rather, Basilica Bell Hunt gaining three, putting Andrea up to 14. And Now, that's a reason to play everything, right? Reed was on the play, oh, yeah. and the fact that he has all of his spells in play means he just didn't have to discard Reed, at all. Reed, Reed had... No cards in hand on turn four, despite drawing two off Champion of Dusk. That's impressive. Yeah, that is that is a Hall of Fame uh, <laughs> level draw, I think, <laughs> by Reed here. Here comes the City's Blessing for that uh, Sky Marcher Aspirant. It looks like Soren's going to tick up, putting a plus plus one counter, and Reed's just going to make it so he can attack with as many creatures as possible here. Yep, he's going to... He's thinking about how many creatures can I get in with? Do I want to hold one back to protect the Soren? And it looks like the Danto Vanguard may end up staying on defense. So not threatening lethal here. Andrea choosing to chump the Vicious Conquistador. Remember, it has Death Touch here to, to fall just to seven. But again, Reed's now got four vampires in play. Andrea can, well, he can play Enter to God Eternals potentially. That, that usually tends to be a pretty big defensive swing here. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned not having an answer to the champion, which was true until now. Well, when I said it, it was true. Yeah, I mean, right. it's it's not easy to get rid of that card. I was it, lying to the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And it gains four life, right? So there we go. There's so. a small, small glimmer of hope. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the most powerful cards Andrea could draw. Duress also pretty good at uh, letting Reed know how he should play this turn. So he's getting a lot of information here. And can choose what to take. He's checking to see how many spells Andrea can cast next turn here. I don't think there's an obvious grab, um, so expect Reed to maybe take take a minute. This is a, a, a critical decision, so he doesn't need to to rush it. Uh, the Oath of Kaya might be what I would go for, but I think it's there's argument. The Teferi being able to reset a card like the Vicious Conquistador that already has multiple counters on it is pretty annoying because a three four is a lot different than a one two that's back in your hand. One advantage uh, potentially to taking Teferi is you can leave back Adanto Vanguard to protect your Soren, and neither Oath nor Noxious Grasp can get rid of it. But uh, on, uh, Reed does have some pretty tough options here because all these are, are viable choices. The Noxious Grasp probably the weakest of the three. All it can kill is Sky Marcher right now. Yeah, the only reason he might want to take the Noxious Grasp would be to d potentially deny playing two spells in one turn because if right. he takes one of the other ones, then we know that Andrea can cast two, two spells guaranteed. Well, this is a close decision, but I mean, a large part of the game is going to hinge on what Reed takes and how he plays out this turn. Because remember, he hasn't used Soren yet, and he has a couple different options on where he wants to put that counter. He's hovering over that oath. It looks like that is going to be the selection. But I don't know. I mean, making making the four five is nice, but it's probably going to get bounced. Now, I think you have to, because if you don't make it into a 4-5, you can't attack. So Reed's going to make the Conquistador attack past that uh, mass token, put Andrea down to 4 here. Andrea draws a land, so works out that uh, 
that Reed didn't try to restrict him to one play. So now Andrea could Teferi bounce a Vanguard kill Soren, but then he would just die on the backswing. Yeah, I, he can't really make that line, so he's he has to bounce the Conquistador and get rid of the Sky Marcher with the Noxious Grasp. Which will leave uh, Andre in the position of chump blocking with his 4 4 if uh, Soren makes the Adanto Vanguard bigger. Oh wow, Andre is going to bounce the Adanto Vanguard, perhaps looking to draw something here. Okay, no, no, he, he does gain one life, sorry. Right. He gains one life from the Noxious Grasp, so that would put him to five. Um, so, yeah, this, this makes sense. Well, the, the Conquistador attack does attack for five here. Oh no, you're right. So I think that now Reed, Reed just has lethal. No, you're right. That, that was, well, he was in a bad spot either way. Yeah, I think what Andrea was looking for was he's not gonna win by letting Soren live, so he's gonna go ahead and try to draw another removal spell, maybe one that can kill the Conquistador like a Legion's End or Tyrant Scorn. Instead, he goes to five, goes to four from Conquistador, and well, the vicious Conquistador lives up to its name and finishes off Andrea Mangucci. So Reed Duke wins the match and will be facing Ben Stark here in the finals. Wow, good stuff. Uh... I mean, he's kind of, he's like, you know, hey. <laughs> I, I would say it's an underdog story, but it's, it's not. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, what's up with the jewelry here? Uh, I you, guess I forgot mine at home. Is yeah, yeah. <laughs> Marshall, you'll have to play in maybe one or two more Mythic Championships yeah. to, to get one <laughs> to of these. To get one of those? Oh, this Looking is the, good, This guys. is just the Hall of Fame ring I wear every day. <laughs> yeah, just when you go pump gas, yeah, you know, yeah. you're just <laughs> blinging it out. Looking good, though. Looking good. So, yeah, uh, great stuff there uh, from Reed, kind of doing, doing the thing that he came here to do, putting himself into that last stretch. Now, he's going to have his hands full with the double trouble that he's going to have to give. Ben, but right. uh, you know that is just kind of how it goes when you're going down the stretch here at MPL Weekly. Thanks so much for joining us, by the way. We're really happy that you've come along on a Saturday to hang out with uh, all of us, and of course, Becca here as well. We do have a short interview, though, that Paul did with Reed. All right, I am once again here with Reed Duke, winning a pretty epic match here against Andrea Mangucci. That game two, though, I mean, I thought you had that one locked up. Yeah, I thought so, too. It was a really good start. Um, you know, the combination of Duress and Gideon is so effective against Esper because they really don't have that many ways to kill a, uh, a three converted mana cost Planeswalker. Um, but Andrea was able to use Tyrant Scorn and uh, Thought Erasure, like, in combination to deal with the Gideon. And then I just couldn't really stick anything, right? Like, I draw a creature, he draw a removal. There's some tricky... Um, you know, jockeying for position with playing around uh, Legion's End after I, I had drawn two copies of the same uh, Danto Vanguard. So definitely a tricky game, but uh, in the end, I knew that if he ever got uh, Liliana Dreadhorde General onto the battlefield in a reasonable position, it was going to be really, really hard for me to win. So I was just hoping for uh, to, to use like Fast Clock plus Duress to manage that, but in that game, it, it didn't work out. Yeah, I mean, it was extremely close. I, I, think, I think you had a lethal attack at one point and he had to find a removal spell, which he did. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately he was able to run away with the game and uh, you actually conceded at 38 life that game. Right, right, yeah. He had Liliana with 10 loyalty, so he was going to decimate all my permanents and then uh, from there, you know, I could have could have had a thousand life and i probably still lose. <laughs> right. And then we had game three, which, which you know, taking a look at Andrea's hand, it, it looked fantastic. I mean, he had a ton of removal spells in his hand. He had the bell hot, but you were able to, I don't know, it, it looked like it was pretty easy for you to kind of fight through all of that. So, yeah, I mean, the, that combination of Soren plus Champion of Dusk is like, the, the that's the easy way to get a, you know, a freebie against Esper. And I was on the play in that third game. So basically as soon as turn two happened and he, cast something other than Thought Erasure. You know, Thought Erasure could have taken my Soren to break up that combo. But when he just had a removal spell, um, granted it was a really good removal spell. He, he sort of blind hit uh, two creatures again with the Legion's End. But yeah, I mean, I was able to to assemble the Soren Champion of Dust co uh, combination. And then from there, the Esper player is just really playing catch up because I have the Planeswalker, the creature, the stacked hand, and they can usually only kill one thing at a time. So it's pretty tough. Yeah, it really looked like, you know, after sideboard with the Gideon on top of that, with having the Soren, just 
the fact that you had kind of a, a threat diversity, if you will, made it really difficult for him to have his removal spells kind of line up the way that he wanted to. Right. Yeah. Um, I didn't know for sure what deck Andrea was going to bring, but I knew he had a he had a good experience with the Esper deck. He went five and two. It's a very well rounded deck. So I was definitely preparing for that matchup. And you know, I figured just keep it simple: four duress, three Gideons, um, low low to the ground. Uh, aggressive deck let's let's put him on the back foot and just hope, hope it works out and i had great draws in all three games and everything's going according to plan so far yeah so now you have a tough matchup ahead of you not now not necessarily matchup in terms of deck but of course you're going to have to win two of the next three yeah. matches and and when i had asked ben he did see it did sound like this was the matchup that he was most afraid of do you think you are pretty heavily favored here going going into the next round um, I would rather be on the vampire side. Mono blue is a deck that plays better when it's ahead than when it's behind. And my deck has 16 one drop creatures. So you can imagine if I win the die roll, you know, Ben never really gets to play the game plan that he designed his deck for. But I've played mono blue a lot, in, in, including at a previous mythic championship this year. And I know it's a, it's a really, really strong deck capable of some great draws Ben's uh, prepared with three entrancing melodies off the sideboard, so that's going to be a really impactful card. Um, yeah, like I said, I'd rather be on the vampire side, but it's still going to be dicey having to, to beat him twice in a row. Well, we've already seen it happen once last week with Li Shi Tian fighting his way through the lower bracket, so uh, maybe we can see it one more time. So uh, maybe we'll see uh, a few extra matches from, from your side. I hope so. All right, back to the desk with Beck. And welcome back to MPL Weekly Marshall Cyclist with Luis Scott Vargas and Seth Manfield. So we're gearing up for that grand final. But before we do, gentlemen, some uh, Throne of Eldrain cards. Anybody? Anybody? Let's take a look at a few yeah. more of those. We've seen some really yep. powerful ones already. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, we get even more. That's, that's great. We do. Th these ones are tagged as limited. Uh, what does I, that mean? Well, I, I, I can only assume... The others? I can only assume that the, these are kind of slated to have more of an impact than limited, but honestly, these cards are pretty good. I could definitely see Stolen by the Fae making an impact in Constructed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like an entrancing melody, but instead of stealing the creature, you get two or three flying one ones, which is pretty good. I mean, we, we look at Clockbridge Troll, it reminds me a lot of a card from a while back called Cloud Goat Ranger. Any, basically, anything in limited that puts multiple creatures on the battlefield and is a creature itself has to yeah, end up being... This one's a little different, though, because it gives them to your opponent. <laughs> it's like, here, have some goats. You know what it reminds me of? What is it called? The Desecrator Demon? De well, there's De there's the Hunted Cycle. So do you remember the 6-6 six, six Flyer? Oh, for Desecration two? Demon, Desecration yes. Demon, and it's like you sack a creature and it gets tapped down. And, uh, you know, as well, you put I mean, it, Louis, you can feed the goat. It's just that you get a benefit here. Right. Imagine in, in a game where your opponent's tapped out, you play the troll, they can take eight, in which case you got a pretty good deal. Yeah. Or they can sack a goat, and sure, they get two zero ones, but you've already gained three and drawn a card, replaced yeah. your, your investment. Yeah, so it's it's with a lot of upside there as well. You said you think uh, stole, Stolen by the Fae might even see a little constructive. Yeah, payment. it's definitely got potential. All these cards look c quite strong and limited. Fairy Guide Mother implies a really fast, uh, you know, kind of white, white beat down deck and limited, which could be pretty cool. Yeah. It is a sorcery speed adventure. Just just note, note that, right? Oh, okay, yeah, that is interesting. Trail of Crumbs. This now, looks like a card I'm gonna enjoy drafting. Yeah, th this is a, you know, we call these build around me on commons, right? And this is the one that you build food around. It. Well, they, <laughs> so, they, they give you the trail of breadcrumbs to follow, right? Yeah. It's, it's, they give you a food, whenever you sack a food, you get to pay one, and in which case, if you reveal a permanent, you can put it in your hand. So what it incentivizes you to do is, first of all, make a bunch of food. Uh -huh. But second, play a deck pretty high on permanents. So if you have too many spells, this, start, this card might start to miss, but looks pretty powerful to me. I thought you were gonna say make a bunch of food then eat a bunch of food. Well, I mean, you do, you do, you do you don't have to sacrifice the food. With my can, yeah. can we just build a deck with all food? Is that a thing that is possible? <laughs> we are gonna try it. So yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Searing Barrage kind of mm -hmm. hints at, uh, you know, one of the one of the, the themes adamant where you want to be monocolor or really heavy in one color. There's a bunch of cards that reward you for for paying three of the same color. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Searing Barrage, in which you know five mana deal five to a creature at instant speed, already good enough there. But sometimes it'll nug your opponent for three too. Covetous Urge, kind of funny, a little slow, right? But uh, stealing your opponent's cards is sweet. 
Yeah, this this card is, is is quite powerful. And then you note that you can also take a card from their graveyard. So if, ah. if the game goes too late and they have nothing in their hand, well, just take the best card out of their graveyard instead. Yeah. But generally, you want to take it from their hand because then you're getting. I, I think value. the mana cost <laughs> the mana cost on the card is really interesting because can you play it if you're not straight to mirror, given it's a hybrid? Yeah, no yeah. way. I think you got to be one or the other, <laughs> Luis. <laughs> Roving keep. How, how, how this guy get in here? <laughs> isn't this your preview? Card? This is my preview card. Uh, you seem befuddled as to why they chose you. Well, well, so look, so here's the thing. I, I may like Hexplate Golem, which is a 7 mana 5 7, a bit too much. Uh -huh. Then putting Roven Keep in is, I can only assume Paul Chion's attempt to sabotage any hope of you know me performing well at the next Mythic Championship. Yes, that's right. You're, <laughs> you're going to take this four spots too high yeah. <laughs> during the draft portion. Well, it's now. a snap keep, as all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that what you thought yeah. when you first saw it? Yeah. <laughs> so good stuff, and of course, more exciting stuff from Throne of Drain as we move forward in preview season. As it stands now, though, we're going to be taking a short break to prep up for the grand final. Don't go anywhere.